All right, it's uh, about 4.50, so I'm gonna get started. Um, hi, I'm Jeremy Stanley, I'm from Sailthrough. Uh, and I'm gonna talk today about building a machine learning system to predict user behavior on Mesos. And just to give you an overview of where I'm headed with this, I'll, I'll start with just a little bit of background on me, Sailthrough, and Sightlines, which is the product, and I'll, I promise I'll keep that mercifully short. Uh, we'll get right into some of uh, how we get cost-effective resources in AWS, the application design, uh, how we make maintenance and evolution of this platform easy, and then I'll go through some lessons learned in building this in a small team at a startup. Uh, and talk about some of the, at the end, some of the new innovation we're driving with this going forward. So a little bit about me. I started out as a math graduate student back in 2000, and I like to think about my career on these sort of two different axes. One of them is uh, indirect value versus direct value. Are people using what I'm, what I'm producing on a day-to-day -day basis, or is this theoretical and eventually it will be applied? And as a math graduate student, it's about as theoretical as it could get. Uh, the other one is on idealism to capitalism. Is this really focused on bettering humanity, uh, or is it directly focused on making money? And so I started out there at the idealism indirect value corner and jumped immediately to capitalism uh, indirect value as a consultant in finance. Um, I then went to an ad tech company as a CTO, uh, a little bit more direct value, but you're still in this big ecosystem. Uh, and definitely very capitalistic, and now the chief data scientist at a marketing technology company here in 2015. A little bit about Sailthrough, it's a software as a service platform. We're based in New York, uh, power over 400 e-commerce and media brands like Mashable or The Economist or Birchbox and Alex and Ani. Collect a ton of different data on site, in email, in mobile applications, and it's all ultimately about personalizing and automating communications, emails, or on-site experiences. So the product that we built that's really uh, running on top of Mesos and AWS is called Sightlines. Uh, and when one of our clients goes into the software as a service platform, they'll be able to see for each of their customers a whole bunch of predictions about what that customer is likely to do in the future. Uh, what's the chance they'll make a purchase? If they make a purchase, how much will it be for? Uh, what are the different channels they're most likely to engage in, and how will they be likely to engage? And then they can take all of those predictions and make decisions about that specific user uh, based upon what we've predicted for them. Make recommendations, personalize experiences, control how they communicate to these users. So it's really a, a predictive service that's embedded into a software as a service communication platform. So what were the requirements for this? Well, we assume we have about five million users for each client. So each one of the clients that we have, these e-commerce or publishing companies, will each have about five million users. The data is coming out of Mongo that we are using that is informing all of the, the information we have about individual users. That's JSON formatted, and it's really siloed across all of the clients. We know we want to predict varying outcomes. We want to predict some things that are binary, and so they should really be a binomial outcome. Other things that will be quantitative, like uh, what would be the purchase price, so that should be a normal distribution. Other things will be Poisson or quantile distributed. So we want to build predictive models to make these uh, predictions, and we want to update those models every day and predictions at least daily. So it's a really, really large batch computation process. And in the end, we only really care about the predictive performance of these models. We're not trying to deeply interpret them or interrogate them. We just want to make sure that we can predict things well. And we want to scale this system to thousands of clients. And so the problem, you know, rather than a lot of e-commerce or uh, media or even ad tech problems are building machine learning systems for a, one specific client or one specific application, here we're, we're building a system that's going to apply to thousands of different clients. So at the beginning, we laid out a strategy to try to do this really cost effectively. Uh, and so the theory was, well, what if we could get really cheap computing power, you know, 10 times cheaper than you typically get it, and then make that computational resource work really, really hard, you know, maybe three times more uh, utilization than you would typically get. Then let's optimize the applications behind all of this for ease of evolution of those applications. And if you think about what the application is, in the end, we spend, say, half of our processing time 
taking all of that JSON data and converting it into features that go into these machine learning models. And the other half of the time is computing gradient boosting machines, which is the, the algorithm that we use to do the predictive modeling. And that's done in memory, and it's really quite well optimized. Uh, so on the JSON to feature side, let's make that something we can really easily evolve and not worry so much about trying to make it really fast or efficient. And then let's set up truly identical A-B environments, soup to nuts, everything, logging, monitoring, uh, you know, everything, uh, so that we can more safely deploy things and change things really quickly and not have to worry about blowing everything up. So if you do the math on all of those different factors, we could still be nine times more cost effective than a more traditional system. And that would let us ultimately iterate aggressively on features you know, and efficiency and scale. So how do we get the cost effective resources? Uh, it's in AWS uh, and everything is, is happy and there are unicorns jumping over rainbows. Uh, it really starts with take an instance in AWS and think about the cost per hour you've got at the very peak, the on-demand cost for this uh, CPU, uh, large CPU and RAM instance is 280. And that comes down you know, by roughly half if you're thinking about taking a reserved instance. But if you go to the spot market for these instances, you can get them for 28 cents. On the other side, what about resource utilization? You know, if you're in a traditional data center, maybe you can get 10%. And if you're in a typical cloud deployment, maybe you're getting 30% resource utilization. What if we could get to 90% resource utilization? Then that's really the math of combining these spot instances and Mesos, and then a tool we created in an open source called Relay, which is really a framework for auto-scaling tasks in Mesos. We were able to get the typical cost of $10 a computational hour uh, for one of these instances down to something close to 30 cents. So AWS spot instance, instances are pretty cool. How many of you have, have used them or know about them? Okay, so a handful of people. So the idea behind the AWS spot instance is that um, you know, we've got an instance type, it's one of these big CPU and RAM instances, and rather than going out and reserving that instance for an hour or for a year, I go into a market and I say, I'll, I'll pay $2 for that instance. And it's a second price auction, so you pay uh, you know, just above what the next person would be willing to pay, and there's a floor on that auction. And so you can plot what you would actually play, pay to get this instance in this availability zone, and it's the yellow curve. And so if I bid $2, I'll on average be spending 28 cents. But every time I hit one of those yellow spikes that exceeds $2, somebody else has come into the market, maybe it's a biotech company or it's a financial services company doing some large computation or it's Netflix, they just released House of Cards and they're soaking up all of the AWS resources and all of my instances in that region suddenly just die. Uh, and they don't die gracefully, they just go away. Um, so all of the computation computational resources are suddenly lost, and this is gonna happen repeatedly. Um, so this is you're not for the faint of heart. It was kind of fun to go into this thinking about how do we design the entire application and platform to not just be able to handle failures, but to be able to handle failures all of the time and big even systemic failures in um, uh, components of the infrastructure. So if you think about the math, in, in this case, I've got 146 agents, and I've now distributed that across four availability zones and two different instance types. Uh, and you know, that's about 3,400 CPUs and 25 terabytes of RAM. And it's costing me $30 an hour. Uh, and if I used this amount of resources all year, it would be just $260,000 a year. If you told me five years ago I could get 25 terabytes of RAM, for a quarter million dollars a year, I would have been completely shocked. Um, so it's amazing you can get that much. And further, we've got this set up such that we're, and it's cut off on the side, so it's not actually 5% CPU utilized and 2% RAM utilized. It's 75% and 92%. Uh, so we're utilizing almost all of the resources that we've got at this point in the cluster. So how we used Mesos, if you think about all of the different agents on the left-hand side, uh, we've got Marathon running as a framework, uh, running the long-running services that are Relay. And so this is this framework, Relay.Mesos, and it's something that we've open sourced. And there are a bunch of different applications that are running in Mesos, and each of those applications in, running in Marathon, each of those applications has a queue size that Marathon doesn't know anything about. 
Uh, and so all Marathon is doing is starting a relay, in relay instance um, out in Mesos uh, that is tied to that specific application. And that relay instance knows about the queue size. Uh, and we have something called Stolos, which is the directed acyclic graph, the DAG scheduler. So anytime you're doing a bunch of ETL pipeline or even machine learning pipeline, inevitably you think about it as a big directed acyclic graph, uh, a whole bunch of different tasks triggering other tasks that eventually collapse back together into whatever it is you want to have happen. And so Stolos knows about that directed graph and knows what can run where and how to, how to sort of bin pack this. And so uh, Stolos will then call out to the actual application code, which in most cases for us is, is Python or R. Um, and so this is repeated throughout all of the different stages of the application. Uh, Marathon is launching a relay uh, framework which actually runs in Mesos, and then it calls back out to the Mesos master to distribute the tasks associated with it. Uh, and the queue sizes of all of these things vary dramatically depending upon where we are in the pipeline. And so Relay is optimizing um, how much resources in Marathon is being allocated to each of those different tasks. So Relay.Mesos has been open sourced. Uh, like I said, it allocates resources based on sizes of queues. Uh, and you can really improve cluster utilization significantly. Uh, this is just a visualization from Labrado uh, of available Meso CPU jiffies. And you know, before and after Relay, uh, we were able to, on average, increase utilization up to 90%. 90% of the time, we were actually doing computations on uh, jobs that we cared about versus being stuck having uh, offers to frameworks that, or to jobs that really didn't have any tasks to run. So let's talk a little bit about the application design. Uh, at the biggest sort of picture level, this is a simplified view of what it looks. We start with uh, all of this data in Mongo, and there's an ETL process that kicks off nightly that pushes all of the data out to S3 uh, in JSON. We then have two kind of primary paths. The top path is to build the models. And so there's a bunch of assembly uh, of all of this data, turning it into features that really characterize the user's behavior for a specific model. And then we build the gradient boosting machines and save those as artifacts back out into S3. So that's that top line. Then once we have those artifacts in S3, uh, we'll run code to analyze those models, to produce visualizations, to better understand how they're performing, to give us more insight on how we want to evolve the models or the features over time. And then we'll have a separate path that's running that will run predictions. Every time data shows up out in S3, we'll read the most recent models for a given client, for a given type of model on a given date, do predictions for all of those users, and then upload those through an API back into Mongo so that they're available to the client the next day. So if it was just this simple, uh, our lives would have been a lot simpler. But uh, this is a visualization of the real directed acyclic graph uh, for running one of these. And this is just one instance of it. We have 1,000 clients. So we actually have 1,000 of these. Uh, and there are 10 models per client. So well, now it's 10,000. Uh, and so you take all of that and start to multiply it out. And being able to manage this giant directed acyclic graph or a bunch of collection of directed acyclic graphs was a real challenge. And so another tool that we've created is called Stolos. And it's this distributed task dependency manager. Um, you can manage, you can sort of templatize what you want your directed graph to look like and parameterize that. And then it will handle all of the queuing and ensure that as long as your applications are idempotent, it will ensure that they run sequentially in the correct way according to the graph. So a really important part of uh, application design and a, and a fun aspect of being in a small team and being able to really think about this holistically is really intelligently using sampling and how we uh, distributed the data. So when we get the data out into S3, it's a single large JSON file for every one of our clients. And the first thing that we do is a Spark job that runs on that JSON and hashes the user's ID identifier and maps each one of the users to 1,000 different shards. And so we get a consistent mapping of those users to 1,000 different files every day. And so we can deterministically go in and say, get 0.1% you know, of users over the last n days and all of the data associated with them. And then have apps move up and down sample as needed to get enough data. 
oftentimes with machine learning, you simply don't need to use all of the data. Uh, and you're going to just throw computational resources away if you, if you try to use it all. So this can be uh, a huge gain in efficiency of the applications. Another big challenge in this was just the JSON data itself. This is a visualization of a single user profile for one of our clients. So this could be me for you know, maybe Jack Threads, uh, a clothing retailer. Uh, and so at the very center is the user themselves, and then spinning off of this is all of the different types of data that we're collecting and these pretty complicated nested JSON structures, things like you know, past purchase behavior and all of the items being purchased and tags or prices or information about those items, all of the different messages that this user has been receiving and all of the different geography, geographies that they've appeared at. Well, when you're doing machine learning, the, the question is how do I turn that kind of really complex tree structure into a matrix, something that has users on one dimension and features on the other dimension. Uh, and that can get really, really messy. Uh, we spent a fair amount of time early on writing custom code to do this and then realized we needed to create a library, some more tooling around doing this in an efficient way. And so there's a library for R called tidyjson. And it allows you to take arbitrary uh, JSON structures and turn it into what are called tidy R data frames. They've got um, uh, a sort of normalized structure, not entirely normalized, but close to normalized. Uh, and it guarantees that that structure is deterministic. So when you run this over a thousand clients and you run into the one client that has a very peculiar structure in their data, uh, it's always going to give you the same structure coming out the other side, even if there are problems in the JSON or irregularities in the JSON. And then it works really nicely in some, some R pipelining. So the choice of the model itself, uh, we use something called gradient boosting machines. How many of you have ever heard of this, GBMs? Another small, small handful of people. OK, so uh, I'll, I'll quickly give you an overview of what a GBM is. How many of you know what a decision tree is? OK, so a lot more people know what a decision tree is. And you know, the great thing about a decision tree is if you keep branching over and over and over again, right, and build a decision tree that has arbitrary depth, eventually you know, every observation, every user is going to end up in a single leaf and you're gonna get perfect predictions on the data that you train on, but then you will go and take this, this, this decision tree and try to use it someplace else and it's going to behave wildly irregular. And it's because you've done something called overfitting the data. So GBMs allow you to have the flexibility of decision trees, but really prevent you from overfitting. And the way it works is you build one really simple decision tree. You can constrain it. You maybe only build it to depth three. And you have a parameter that tells you how much you're going to trust the decision trees. And you look at this tree's performance out of sample, and, and you credit it in some way. You trust it a certain amount. And then you iterate and you build the second decision tree to correct the first one's errors. And then the third decision tree to correct the errors of the first two, and so on. And you can do this thousands of times. Eventually, you'll be able to completely overfit the data, but what's really cool about it is as you move along, you can track how much you're overfitting on some other held out set of data and stop at a certain point when you start to really overfit the data. And you have a, a, a model that really generalizes very well. So the reason we chose GBMs is you can predict lots of different varying outcomes. They're flexible enough to capture all of the nonlinearity and complex interactions that we might find in the data. And there's not a lot of hyperparameters that you have to tune for, things like depth and shrinkage and number of trees. I've got to decide that for every client, for every model, you know, what values to use for those metaparameters. Uh, and some models will end up having 10 of these values, which makes it quite a bit more complicated and expensive to use them at scale. They're also really robust to missing values, so if any of the data is missing, the GBM can handle that. Uh, but you could use other, other types of models, you know, things like neural networks, to accomplish similar goals. So then the question is, well, how do you distribute a gradient boosting machine into an environment like Mesos? And the kind of obvious uh, but naive approach to do this would be to build each tree separately uh, on a separate node, right? You've got a additive equation up there, um, why can't I just distribute it across the sum? Well, it's because the, the nature of the GBM algorithm is iterative. I want to take each tree and correct the errors of all of the prior trees. So if I do this, I actually get something called random forests, not gradient boosting machines, and uh, they won't perform as well. So another approach is, well, let's take each tree, and it's working on a large set of data, 
So let's distribute the computation of that tree across many nodes. And basically, doing a decision tree is all about finding the optimal split points. And so there are ways of distributing that computation and then pulling the results back together uh, to try to get a, a decision tree built. There are libraries like uh, in Spark with MLlib or H2O uh, or in Mahout that do this. But it, it turns out there's a ton of uh, overhead and coordination, right? You're having to replicate the data to all of the nodes, do all of these computations, bring it back together, and then iterate still thousands of times. And so it's really inefficient for many small gradient boosting machines. And so what we've done is, well, we actually have to build 50,000 of these things. We've got 1,000 clients, we've got 10 models, we want to do cross-validation, we want to build multiple of these models each time on different subsets of data to validate it. So that in and of itself means we've got to build 50,000 GBMs, so let's just build each GBM and distribute that. And as long as the GBMs don't need more RAM than they can get on a single node, I'm fine. And it turns out that if you're using more RAM than you have on a single node for this problem, you're just wasting computational resources anyways. Uh, it's plenty of RAM and plenty of data to get the predictive performance that we want. So that's the distribution. Um, we do have one other problem, which is determining those metaparameters. We gotta figure out what the depth should be, what the learning rate should be, the optimal number of trees. And so we actually have to do a grid search. So not only is it 50,000 models, but we do this every week uh, on a rolling schedule. We'll do a grid search over, say, 100 different combinations of these parameters to figure out what they should be for each client's model. So it's a lot of computational resources. And if you think about the traditional infrastructure used for a lot of startup-y kind of data science uh, applications, it looks a little bit like this if data scientists are putting it together. We really wanted to avoid that. Um, and so we worked hard up front to try to use uh, tools and infrastructure that would really help us uh, do this in a scalable way, you know, from a person perspective, being able to have good monitoring and alerting, uh, and being able to use tools like Marathon or Spark and, and obviously Mesos when appropriate. Um, but in a larger picture, something that we did that you know, I, I wish I would always have the ability to do this is literally we just created two identical copies of the infrastructure. We've got the JSON data going to S3 every day, and so we process, it's not just a staging environment or a testing environment. We process all of the data for all of the models, right? And do all of the computations every day twice in these two different infrastructures. And at any given point in time, one of them is pointed to the actual API that pushes the data into Mongo. And so as you develop on your laptop and you know, are committing things into Git and doing integration tests if you have that or unit tests if you have them, uh, we can deploy out to a Docker image and say that right now we're at uh, version one and that image is the same used in both A and B, we make some change to tooling, to configuration, to applications, really anything. We can upgrade Mesos. Um, and we'll test that on the B infrastructure. And something doesn't work and we have you know, massive instability or right, everything just breaks. Well, we can just skip that and move, move ahead, do something different, fix whatever the issue was. And then we'll go through and check the monitoring for things like, well, his utilization improved when we made this change, or has it changed significantly? Um, checking all of the logging and the analytics on the logging. Are we seeing the same distribution of warnings and errors in the applications? And ultimately, we'll look at the predictive performance of all of the models, and have they gone up for which clients, uh, for what types of models? And if we can satisfy all of those requests, then we can switch and start doing the pushes from B and reset A to be version 1.02 and then start over again. So we can do this every day and it makes it really, really easy to make radical changes to the infrastructure and not have to worry about it. And the only reason it's cost effective, I don't know that Twitter could do this with tens of thousands of instances, but we can because we're using these spot instances which are so cheap. So now I'll kind of step back a little bit and talk about some of the lessons learned in putting this together. The first was to definitely build multiple layers of fault tolerance. You know, even though we have these A, B environments that are identical, uh, you would still be surprised at how often something else happens and causes whichever instance is primary to have issues. And so at the lowest level, the infrastructure should be distributed and redundant. 
Uh, scheduling, I really like scheduling that just ensures one plus execution. Uh, and then the apps should just be item potent. If you can do that, especially in a batch processing system and just kind of have that as a design principle from the beginning, life gets a lot easier. Uh, and then at the application layer, take that extra step and fall back to stale data. Use models from the most recent day that they were built uh, if you need to so that you can have these multiple layers of fault tolerance and you don't have to worry as much. Second is to keep the apps in the infrastructure really isolated and simple. Uh, and you know, one of the people on my team, Alex, who spoke earlier, uh, he put it this way, if you can't explain it in a sentence or you need a lot of tests, it's too complicated. And there was always the, the drive or the desire to overload something and its usage to use Zookeeper both for um, uh, uh, you know, discover, or not for discovery, but for uh, coordination amongst the Mesos master, and maybe also use it as a key value store in the application, right? Really bad idea. Keep things clean and simple and separated. Um, so, you know, Mesos, resource management, Zookeeper, it's just the consistent cluster state. Marathon, only use it as an init process for long running services. Uh, Relay, it's our task auto scaling. Stolos is the DAG scheduling. Consoles, infrastructure service discovery, et cetera. Everything really simple uh, and easily explainable. Third, we, we, we built this infrastructure so we could experiment and try new things. And we've tried a lot of different things. Um, and the key there is to kind of bound your investment in the tools and know when to give up when something just isn't going to work or to fundamentally evolve how you use it. Uh, so for example, we tried for, for maybe a month, maybe more, to try to get Marathon to handle a really large number of tasks, you know, thousands of short-lived tasks. Uh, and eventually, it just, we, we realized it wasn't possible. We couldn't make it work. And uh, that was the beginning of building out the, uh, the relay uh, system. Kronos, uh, it can't handle thousands of independent directed acyclic graphs. <laughs> you, know, you can't really parameterize things in Kronos. Uh, so that took us a few weeks to figure out. Spark, we've tried to use it uh, across the uh, application probably you know, six, seven times. And in a few places, it's worked well for us. But in a lot of places, it just adds a lot of extra complexity and doesn't really improve performance. Unless your data really can't fit into RAM, uh, there's no reason to use it unless you really like the interface. And then we also spent a fair amount of time on HDFS. And you know, ultimately, I wish we had earlier decided just use S3. We're in AWS. Uh, we don't need to have direct access to an HDFS cluster. Yes, S3 is eventually consistent, but you can design the applications to, to tolerate that in the infrastructure that we've set up. Uh, so it's just much easier to outsource that entirely and, and, and use S3. Fourth, we've worked pretty hard to avoid any static partitioning you know, of the infrastructure, of the services, of the batch. Uh, it's just much more cost effective to pool the resources together entirely and run everything in the same resource pool. And if you design them all to be you know, equally tolerant to failures, and you know, you've got something that can coordinate all of this, you're great. But you do have to have a means of guaranteeing minimum requirements for, for some of these services, especially when you're using spot instances. And you could, you know, for an hour, lose conceivably three quarters of all of your computational resources. And then finally, overall, you know, optimize for innovation. You know, build a, a quick MVP. Uh, but at the same time, you know, early on, we decided to focus on redundancy and deployment and monitoring and try to get that right relatively early on. And throughout, we've stayed about 10 times ahead of scale requirements in the different components that we have. Um, and that really allows us, when something goes wrong, we can flex much easier uh, to whatever those events are. Uh, and then we can make iterative infrastructure and app investments just to drive ROI. Once we've got all of the measurement in place and the MVP in place, all of the monitoring we need, uh, it's you know, really quick to be able to release new features or new changes to how the system works. So just a little insight into where we're going next, what we're developing right now. So beyond just predicting absolutely what's, what a user is likely to do, so will they make a purchase, and if so, for how much, we're beginning to predict, well, what's the probability distribution over the catalog of items that this user might buy? 
Uh, so you might have 1,000 or 10,000 different items. The user is going to make a purchase. If I could tell you, uh, well, this is the specific item they are most likely to buy in, they'd, they'd have a 15% chance of that showing up in the basket, and then this is the next most likely item. It's incredibly powerful for making you know, better recommendations, essentially reversing search. There are a variety of other fun use cases for it, too. The uh, infrastructure is going to be the same, but the application design will be quite different. So now we have both users and items. So the same user profile as before, but now individual items that we have images for and long text descriptions for, other metadata associated with them. And so we can generate a bunch of user features. We can generate a bunch of item features, but we can also generate joint features, features that are a function of both the user and the item. And essentially, that's collaborative filtering, right? So you can do uh, things in collaborative filtering like nearest neighbors based approaches, or you can do matrix factorization or other collaborative filtering approaches. Use those to generate features and then feed all of the features into the gradient boosting machine and let it ultimately make the predictions about the chance that a user will purchase an item. And just to give you a quick sense, this is an early visualization of what this looks like if I take on the vertical axis 500 different users and on the horizontal axis 500 different items and look at individual users' affinities for specific items and then cluster the users and I cluster the items, you end up with uh, sets of items like you know, this group number eight for whom there are whole sets of users that have you know, very little comparative chance of purchasing the items, and other sets of users that will be really interested in them. And so it's a, a really novel and automated way to discover users' interests and then be able to change how you interact with them. So that's the end of the talk. And uh, just quickly, this is our team, uh, Div and Alex. Alex spoke earlier today about the challenges of uh, optimizing scheduling in Mesos. Uh, Andros from Ishi Systems uh, has helped us tremendously. Myself and, and Max is the newest member of the team. Uh, so we're absolutely recruiting. If you're interested, feel free to come talk to me or to Alex. Uh, and uh, that's it. Happy to take any questions. So it's a little dark there in the, towards the back. Yeah. So on a typical day, you know, this was pulled from relatively recently in production. You know, we had 146 spot instances. And this would just be in one of the environments. So combined, we would have around 300. I think it, you know, the highest we've probably gone up to is maybe three, 400, 500. And I think a big part of this, we also auto scale the number of instances to be able to capitalize on spot instance prices being lower at certain times of the day. Uh, and just also to be able to get our computations done sooner. Another question next. Yeah. No, so we started with all instances being spot instances in the Mesos cluster. Um, and so conceivably, you know, there could be situations where across multiple availability zones, the price spikes dramatically and we get shut out of the market and have just no computational resources. Uh, that wasn't a problem when we were just running the applications, uh, but when we started to run some of the infrastructure like Logstash, uh, inside of Mesos, that becomes a problem. You don't want your infrastructure to go down. And so we have started to blend in some um, on-demand instances, and we'll probably make those reserved instances so that we can guarantee that we always have a minimum amount of computational resources to meet infrastructure requirements. Uh, but I haven't yet seen a, you know, I don't think it's cost sustainable to shock the market across multiple availability zones for enough time to price us out of the spot market when we wouldn't be able to do our computations. It would be a ridiculous thing for someone to do because they would probably at that point be spending more than they would spend just on on-demand. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so it, it turns out that we've worked really hard to make all of the applications, and I didn't talk to this specifically, but to make all of the applications as small as possible. 
uh, so that they're generally just occupying one or two CPUs and you know, roughly that proportion of RAM on the instances. Uh, so to that, to that effect, it hasn't particularly mattered. Um, and you know, we've tended to err on the side of using newer spot instance types because they'll be less competitive in the market. Uh, people will you know, um, uh, set up their system to use a specific instance type and then they'll, they'll let that go, right? And they won't go back in and change it. So whenever AWS releases a new instance type, uh, we can kind of arbitrage on that instance type because nobody else is using it yet. Um, so uh, being able to make the tasks really small just makes the bin packing problem much easier. You know, early on, we would do things like you know, run Spark in local mode in Mesos on one of these instances. Um, and we would require that we have 20 or 30 CPUs, but then the bin packing problem becomes really difficult. Uh, and so by just making everything really finely grained, idempotent, and, and then having the distributed system to make sure everything runs at least once, uh, the bin packing problem becomes pretty simple. Yeah, in the back. Uh, how do you provision your instances and manage upgrades of master and Yeah, it's a good question. So we started out using Chef and still use Chef. Uh, and so everything's automated through, through Chef uh, for provisioning of the instances. Um, you know, the, we're, we're moving to the applications are now all running in Docker. Um, and you know, I think we, we, that's been really helpful to sort of separate the configuration, the management of all of the application from the instances themselves. Um, but honestly, if you want to know even more about it, I would talk to either Alex or Andros, uh, who understand you know, that at a, at, a, at a better level than I have. Other questions? All right, thanks everybody. <laughs>